good morning, good morning, good morning. Today is a day of history and money and finance. And I'm going to take a nap because I'm going to let these two gentlemen, Paul Kiker is here and Dr. Wheeler is here, and we're going to be talking about money and more money because you're going to talk about gold and the gold rush in Georgia. So you got the money ang angle, you got the big money angle, and I'm going to sit here and take a nap. Because if y'all didn't know it, my child had a wreck last night and he had a bad wreck. And we thank God he is alive. Um, he probably has two broken bones in his arm because they're protruding. And I'm going to take him Ugh. to the hospital as soon as I leave here today. We've had an all-nighter. We've been up all night. And I'm so sleepy, y'all. I'm so tired. And anyway, Paul and Dr. Ken are going to do this. And I'm just going to sit here and smile. Is that this okay with y'all? This ought to be really fun today because she's been a little <laughs> delirious in some of our conversations. So I we're like going to have a great time today. Yeah. They're going to take advantage of me. Two, old, two, two guys are going to take advantage of old granny. So it's going to be okay. You don't run on, let, on very little sleep as oh, good as you used to, man, do Man, I tell you. I tell you, my, my Fitbit gave me an F today. So, Dr. Wheeler, if you were grading my paper, you'd have given me an F on my sleep pattern last night. Wasn't much of it. So. Mm. So anyway, thank you for your prayers. Everybody was reaching out this morning, checking on Nick. He's okay. Thank God he had on a seatbelt. Thank yeah. God, because if not, he w I would be calling Kevin Rucker this morning. It was bad. So Did he flip anyway, the car? No, but it went airborne, and okay. he was like eight feet up in the air and then down, uh -huh. and his head hit the top of the... Mm. And that's where you break your neck. Yeah. Yeah. Dale Earnhardt could attest to that. That's yeah. where you break your neck and you die. Mm. So so we were very fortunate and I'm very thankful and it's a truck. It's just a truck. So it's yeah. what insurance is truck's for. gone. So anyway, so you and Dr. Wheeler just met and y'all are gonna talk and first of all introduce yourself and tell people a little bit about you. Well sure. I'm I'm uh, Professor Kenneth Wheeler. I teach at Reinhardt University in Waleska and of course I've been there since nineteen ninety nine. And over the years, we've had so many uh, L.A.J. and Gilmer County students mm -hmm. come through and mm -hmm. have more there right now. And so yeah. it's just a pleasure to be here today. Thanks Thank for you. welcoming me. I'm so glad you're here because I loved, I saw you at the Historical Society and you didn't get to hear, um, we had a, a good group that night. And we were talking about the Cherokee removal. I would and, have enjoyed that. And you know a lot about what we did yeah. to the Cherokee, but you wrote about it and you wrote factual things that go through, did I hear you say 1895? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was yeah. what, 1827, 1895 is your book, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now tell me why after teaching for these many years you've decided that you need to put it in book form and tell everybody. Oh, well, uh, you know, I do teach a History of Georgia class mm -hmm. at Reinhardt and, and you know, um, it, you know the, when you live in a place you just get interested in mm -hmm. what's, what's here now how did it get to be this way? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just start digging into mm -hmm. the county records and old newspapers and you start talking to people who have, you know, family collections of documents and, and so that just, it led me down a path to uh, try to understand the development of northern Georgia mm -hmm. in the 19th century. And and uh, you know f for uh, for a lot of North Georgia, you know the big the big kapow moment is the discovery of gold, mm -hmm. and the gold rush. and it's the gold rush that follows. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. And mm -hmm. so, how important to the development of, of Georgia or, or North Georgia was the gold rush? Oh, I think it's has huge importance in the development of the state. You know, there are, there are little gold strikes in southwestern Virginia and little bits of western North Carolina. But when it becomes known, and you know, if you go to Dahlonega, they'll say, oh, people knew before and stuff. And you know, maybe, maybe, but it's not publicly known. But in 1829, it becomes publicly known mm -hmm. that there are gold strikes in North Georgia, and not just in Dahlonega, but really, they're on a line, and anybody, you didn't have to be smart. You could just start looking at a map of Georgia and figure out where a couple of those were and match them up with the strikes in North Carolina and Virginia and just draw your line across the map. Okay. And you knew where that gold belt was likely to be. Mm. And, of course, you know, the, the immediate effect is thousands of people just inundate uh, that area of North Georgia. And, as we know, this was the Cherokee Nation mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. at the time. And so for the Cherokee, right, it's a tragic story, you yeah. know, mm. they, they were Terrible. there, and, you know, thousands of them living in their own, you know, Cherokee Nation. 
And so as soon as it's realized among Georgia whites that the, that the gold belt just runs right through the Cherokee Nation, they're there all the time. And there aren't enough, uh, you know, there aren't enough U.S. federal soldiers to keep the peace. You know, they'll, they'll come in and tear down uh, shacks and mining equipment. But those guys, they'll just go outside the nation and then they'll come in at dark and they'll they'll just dig at night and put their ore into sacks and yeah, drag it, it back, out. haul it out by Isn't morning. Crazy? That is That's by me, crazy. It's human nature though. Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. So what was the event in 1827 that, that, so what happened? What was the discovery? How did it become public information? Well, these are strikes in 1829 that, 1829. that become, that make it into the newspapers. Okay. And, and pretty soon there, people are finding gold all over the place, okay. you know. So, and once you do, I mean, you know, it is attractive to just pull wealth out of the ground. I yeah. mean, I just have to say, you know. Yeah, I mean, sounds who, good to me. Who, now, now, I had heard they found one of the largest nuggets was in Gilmer County, correct? Oh, uh, yeah. That, that I had heard about, like north of here. What, where was that around? I can't remember. Uh, uh, in between here and Blue Ridge. At some Cherry point. Log. Cherry Log area. Yeah. Was that was that during that period of time? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I no. heard it's now you've given him. Now there. you've given the teacher something. Yeah. To yeah. yeah. No, yeah. you're making me think. If yeah. there's anybody yeah. out there that knows that I had heard, not Owltown uh, Creek, but it's somewhere in Cherry Log, I had heard that that's a rumor that had been told. They found one of the largest nuggets in North Georgia wow. in this area. Wow. Wow. But um, so, uh, so, so the gold rush mm -hmm. gets started. Yeah. How did that bring about the removal of the Cherokee, uh, the Cherokees? Greed. Can I guess? Well, agree. How is it connected? And, Teacher, can I and, guess? And, and politics, because of course the president of the United States, Andrew Jackson, he mm -hmm. he felt like he got jobbed out of the presidency in 1824. He made it to the White House in 1828, and he likes to be reelected in 1832 if he can. And there aren't any votes for him within the Cherokee Nation. The Cherokee are part of the Cherokee Nation. They just vote right internally okay. they don't vote for the president of the United States and so it's Georgia Whites and Andrew Jackson's doing everything he can to win their approval and so after the you know after the gold rush begins in 1829 Jackson immediately starts with the what will become the Indian Removal Act of 1830 that it makes me cry and and in Georgia they're they're like Andrew Jackson he's our man and so and so you know that act gets passed in Congress, signed by Jackson. But there is also a period, and it's a fascinating period, from really 1829, 1830, all the way to the Trail of Tears in 1838, when the Cherokee Nation, they're still all there. Most mm -hmm. of them are still there. Uh, thousands of them. They've been, they've been, they've lost the, the legal rights to their land but they still have occupancy rights. Okay. And so it's a very uncomfortable period of years in which whites are busily developing towns, mm -hmm. taking over ferries across rivers, mining gold, you know, searching for wealth. And in fact, it's right on the very fields and lands of these Cherokee farmers. Right. And in many cases, you know, ousting them from their homes and just moving right in. You know, I should know this, but I but I don't because that's a lot of history here that I've actually never studied or been taught. I guess. Mm -hmm. So, were the Cherokee was the Cherokee population combative and warring with the local population? Were they were they docile? Were they like? Would you know, Paul Kiker be if somebody showed up at your house trying to take everything? Lord, no, I wouldn't be. You know that. <laughs> yeah, he's I'm in like, jail. I'm like, let's fight. You're on my land. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, there. Um, I mean, we find. You know, what we see with the Cherokee is there is a great effort by the federal government not to have warfare. Okay. Uh, they've seen how expensive that is with mm -hmm. the creeks in Alabama, with the Seminoles in Florida, and so they do everything they can to pacify the Cherokee Nation. And the Cherokee Nation also has a lot of people who are bilingual, they speak English, right. they, they are they trained. They had educators, they had attorneys. Mm -hmm. so see, that, yeah. And attorneys, in fact, yeah. who will appear in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. And mm -hmm. so they really are channeling their efforts toward a legal remedy. And in fact, the Supreme Court of the United States is really siding with the Cherokee Nation. As I should. And at the same time, too, the, the Cherokee 
just recognize the facts on the ground, which is right. that if it's warfare, they'll be obliterated. Right. It may feel good in the moment to, uh, you know, to, to uh, defend your property, but also they just understand that this is not a winnable situation militarily. So they weren't running around and killing lots of people. They are I mean, not. I'm sure it. There are a, there few, were probably instances, a few incidents. There are right? a few incidences that make their way There's into the legal records. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, But it, but, but all There's of it is, but kidding. all of it is handled by the legal system okay. in Georgia. But the legal system didn't do a very good job of protecting them the, because of the money. The legal, the well, at the county level where okay. you would have like you know assaults mm -hmm. dealt with. In fact, the legal system is pretty fair mm -hmm. about how they handle horse thieving and and you know uh, dispossession of land but but the state of Georgia passes laws that make it illegal for the Cherokee to mine gold they make it they pass laws that that's criminal. So, so, that is criminal gold. yeah on their own no. land no, I, is criminal. I've we seen, can mine gold. No, yeah. I've seen female Cherokee women, Cherokee women who are prosecuted or indicted and then eventually the charges are dropped, but indicted for mining gold. Wow. That is crazy. So, Absolutely crazy. Yeah. So there was a double standard in the in the justice system even well, then. Sure. Yeah. And so 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 you see it you see it very clearly. Yeah. But of course, by eighteen thirty eight then there is Cherokee removal and so okay. the federal government rounds up the Cherokee and to send them west into modern day Oklahoma, at the time called the Arkansas Territory. And, and that's a- In all the a, government's wisdom, during the worst snowstorm ever, when people froze to death? Yes, this is true. It was a yes. terrible cold winter. Yes, and, yes. And the, the summer was- The government at work, yeah. again. The government so, at work again. So it was, so it was at the state level, did the state solicit the federal level to come in and, and, and remove the Cherokee? So how did it end up federal come down? And it's, it's, it's mutual. The, okay. um, the Cherokee state government wants the Cherokee, uh, sorry, Georgia state government uh -huh. wants the Cherokee removed. Okay. And that gold rush provides a, a great political emphasis okay. to make that happen. And then at the federal level, the Supreme Court is not with the state of Georgia uh, but the federal government under Andrew Jackson is, okay. and ultimately it is federal soldiers who do the rounding up okay. and, and local people who are brought into service in a, for a short t period of time. Mm -hmm. Cash money was scarce. And, the, and Dr. Wheeler, what was the total number cash. we lost on that trail of tears? Well, thousands? thousands of people yeah. die out of the yeah. 16,000 who were removed. Mm -hmm. We think wow. that maybe <clears> about 4,000 of the Cherokee do not live to Mm -hmm. to you know resume their lives in right. in the west and do we right have a west. number now of how many cherokee hid in the hills do we is there ever an estimate we don't know you know and, and yeah and i think they were smart enough to do that and I, I think there were some that never left here and I'm, I'm thankful that they didn't leave here shame that they stayed and didn't get to keep their land and their that's right. pottery and their dishes and everything else they had but you right. know that's but they, true they remained here that's exactly right. And the, of course, the whites who take over are, you know, frankly, a lot of them are very ambitious, talented mm -hmm. people. And they, and they, and they, you know, come in in the late 1830s and the early 1840s. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's good to be first on the ground, you know. And so with Cherokee removal, some of the people who come in right away are people who are going to build up their own, mm -hmm. uh, build up their own mm -hmm. prospects and fortunes over time. And, and some of them, some are gold miners, but some are also iron makers. You know, mm -hmm. minerals often occur, occur mm -hmm. in clumps, and right. it's not just gold in North Georgia, but a lot of other minerals, including iron ore. And out on the frontier, the, these were this was very necessary. Right. That you have, blacksmith shop. That's yeah. right, blacksmiths yeah. Yeah. and forges and furnaces. You know, because you know horses need shoed, and, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. you know people need hinges and nails and. And uh, you know, pretty soon you will need, uh, you know, you'll need, you know, iron plating, and you need um, for the ore stamper machines. Mm -hmm. You've got to, you know, it helps to have uh, mill wheels, et cetera, that are built more durably than of wood. I want to ask you a question about Georgia because we had some property over in Alabama that was near Cornwall, Cornwall Furnace, mm -hmm. where they made cannonballs for the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Are there any furnaces like that in Georgia? Oh, there certainly are. 
And in, and in fact, uh, the Cornwall furnace, is that, are mm -hmm. you talking Etowah? Uh, likewise. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah, these are the mm -hmm. same people who built mm -hmm. furnaces mm -hmm. uh, really on. Did you know about that? No, it's I a really didn't. cool place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really cool. They, yeah, the, the, they're the furnace makers who come on down here, they're German Americans mm -hmm. and they've been doing iron making just for generations and they, they start out in sort of Baltimore and Pennsylvania, and then they come then down. Then they find out about country cooking. And then they, that's <laughs> right. And come down and through. And then marry a good southern woman. <laughs> come down through the Carolinas, and yeah, they set yeah. up in like Habersham County, Georgia, yeah. outside of the Cherokee Nation. And then once Cherokee removal happens, they're immediately down on the Etowah River mm -hmm. and its tributaries, Stamp mm -hmm. Creek in mm -hmm. Bartow County, right, over right. near east of Cartersville. And uh, and these people, they they have they have forges going, and then furnaces. And I mean, we're talking about. Uh, you know, stone, sort of flat-topped mm -hmm. pyramid mm -hmm. furnaces. Mm -hmm. that Cornwall would, furnace still stands. That would, yeah, yeah, that would yeah. go into blast for six months at a time, and they would get all that iron ore collected, and they would make charcoal, and the charcoal's ready, and they would have limestone to draw cool. off the yeah. impurities and everything, mm -hmm. and then they, they would put those furnaces in blast, yeah. and the melted iron ore would come on out, you know, tap the furnace twice a day, and you know, you'd pull that terracotta plug, and that mm -hmm. that 2,400 degree uh, iron that ore would just yeah. spill right. out yeah. into the you know a little uh, a puddling area where it would go into troughs mm -hmm. and make bar iron, mm -hmm. and th they call those pigs. Mm -hmm. You probably heard pig mm -hmm. iron, yeah, because yeah, right. they're like little yeah. piglets uh -huh. nursing uh -huh. at the sow. Yeah. Yeah. And then you'd also have guys who'd have long dippers, long handled dippers, and they mm -hmm. would dip it up and put it into precast molds. And so mm -hmm. you make your skillets mm -hmm. and your little okay. fire dogs. Well, the and, big iron skillets yeah. and, and the big wash pots. I, I happen to have a wash pot for sale. Do you have you a really? farm now. You need a wash <laughs> pot. There, there you go. Everybody needs a big wash pot. And this is, I think it's a number 40. Maybe or no, maybe number two. Anyway, it's the big one, and it's so cool to me that that has washed clothes, it has boiled hog heads, it has done everything, mm -hmm. as the yeah. Cherokee did and as the American frontier did. That's right. So yeah, it's so cool. I know it. Yeah. And really of course, neat. gold diggers, uh, they often have a little riffled pan, a Georgia pan mm -hmm. is what mm -hmm. they would call it, and that too, that's iron, and you yeah, know, right. it's got those riffles in the bottom yeah. to catch the heavier little bits mm -hmm. of gold that get True. stuck down in there. Yeah. So there's a lot of demand for product, mm -hmm. and these iron makers come down and they say, oh yeah, we're supplying. So they love Georgia. They yeah. do, they yeah. absolutely yeah. do, and so they build those iron furnaces, and those ruins are still mm -hmm. still uh, extant mm -hmm. there, and at uh, Cornwall Furnace in Alabama, mm -hmm. and on down to Tannehill, uh, just amazing. southwest of Birmingham. Mm -hmm. Well, this weekend we watched something, and I don't know if you and Holly ever do this, but if you go, I love historical houses. I just love, mm -hmm. and if there's a beautiful historical home, if you look around it, there was once an old farm there, and there were once slaves there, and there were once other things there, and Juliet, Georgia is a perfect example of that. And the state of Georgia has a beautiful farm there that you can tour and, and, and you can see the workings of a farm that mm -hmm. had slaves, and then when the slaves were freed, then they gave them their little homes and, and they decided they wanted to remain on the property because that's where they'd grown up, that's where they'd raise their children. And so mm -hmm. the, the owner of the plantation would then let them stay there. And if you haven't been out in the state of Georgia and visited historical homes, historical sites, people need to do that. You know, they need to just go to an old home place Agreed. and learn a little bit about it. Yeah. Almost anybody in Georgia mm -hmm. lives a, a pretty short distance, a day trip to, yes. you know, yes. see marvelous a historical sites. A vacation, as I call it. Yeah, a a vacation. vacation. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well worth the time. Yeah, everybody needs to do that. Mm -hmm. so. Now, I, I've got a couple more questions for you about, specifically about the political ramifications. But before yeah. we go there, so I like to fly fish when I'm out west. I've seen, mm -hmm. I'm just fascinated by the old mines that are <coughs> in the side of the mountains. Mm -hmm. But So what what happened to the, so we discover gold. Yep. Prospecting takes place. Yes. There's enough to get the Indians removed as a byproduct of yes. that. But you don't hear of a Comstock load here. It sounds like, you know, it, you have this gold. Did we just not have that much gold in this area? Did it become too expensive to mine? So what, mm -hmm. what happened to the gold trade? Okay. So uh, a lot of times we look at the Georgia gold rush and then we compare it to what we know will happen decades later in the West. Yeah, right? Comstock California, mm -hmm. yep. Carson City, mm -hmm. Nevada. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, 
But in terms of the in terms of the United States at the time that the Georgia gold rush happened, these were the biggest gold strikes in American history. Really? At the time? At the time, okay. the biggest gold in strikes Georgia. in Georgia. Wow. And so and so some of that gold, you know, it's so much that the federal government builds a branch of the U.S. Mint in Dahlonega, okay. but not even all the gold goes into that. Some foreign mining companies would come in, they would mine gold, and then they would just take it back to their mm -hmm. home country. There were people who worked gold into jewelry. Okay. This sh wouldn't surprise us when mm -hmm. you think about mm -hmm. it. There was even a private mint that worked in Gainesville, Georgia. Hmm. And so, so we don't even know how much gold was coming out, but it was for the economy of the United States at the time, amount. it was a substantial amount. And so there were certainly people who worked in the gold rush and mm -hmm. all through the 1830s and at the end of the 1840s, they said, here we go, on to the next. And so then they, they disappeared. Okay. And, you know, but there's still gold mining in Georgia all the way through the right. 19th century and into the 20th. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the big money is made in the 1830s. Okay. And so, and so you find you know, it easier to access deposits out west and you do, new territories. Well, and yeah, if, if you're not killed crossing the plains <laughs> right. or if you don't die yeah. of disease going across <laughs> the right. isthmus, you know, across mm -hmm. through Panama, mm -hmm. et cetera. So, mm -hmm. so, it's a, so it's a hazardous, a hazardous uh, to try to get out there sometimes, but mm -hmm. plenty of people thought it was worth their while. But that's all in the future. For, you know, for Americans in the 1830s, all they know is the gold in America is in Georgia. Mm -hmm. That is all right. they know. Mm -hmm. And so, and you know, the country had expanded incredibly by the late 1840s and the economy had expanded. So it was just a different sort of setting in which those gold strikes in California at Sutter's mm -hmm. Mill and beyond. Are, okay, you're the money man and you're mm -hmm. the gold man. Yeah. If, if today, okay, in during the times that the strikes were happening, yeah. how much was gold an ounce? Oh, Do I you don't know? know. No, I don't. Do you, know, you I have don't a clue what it, it might have been? Before the government confiscated and reset in 1931, it was $16 an ounce. Mm -hmm. and now but that's it's back when our money was... 1800 an ounce? We were gold-based during that period of time, so we had some restraint to our monetary policy on the government level. So, you know, I, I don't know. I've, I've seen charts going back through history looking at inflation and the interesting thing is, is when we were, when we were gold linked, imagine that as a magnet that draws two, so or or a pendulum, right? So if we count this as the pendulum, inflation would come about, but because because our monetary supply was limited in its growth, it would come to deflation on the other side, and we were always hovering around. So it was actually easier to build your wealth when we were on a gold standard because all you had to do is save. You know, you didn't have inflation eroding. My grandmother proved supply. that. So I would assume, and this is just a wild speculation, based on some of the numbers back there, we were probably pretty close to $16 an ounce at the time. I mean, I would, just, I would think it's less than that, maybe $10 or $12 an ounce, but I don't know. I'd like to go back. I don't know where I would Be find that. Be interesting to find out. That's one of the questions I had for you was, mm -hmm. was, so how did you do the research on this, right? Like, how do you find this information from the 1830s? Have you got graduate students you call, are helping you, you, you. call folks just, you know hey in 1830 what were you doing <laughs> well uh you know in some ways thanks to digitization mm -hmm. we have access to a lot of things that we didn't that were that are always there but not but not as accessible not readily as accessible. they are so you know a lot of times my research took place in historic newspapers okay that are available now through mm -hmm. the Georgia Newspaper Project mm -hmm. in a digital form and people can go on to Galileo through their public library and hmm. get access to those Georgia historic newspapers. It's a marvelous resource. Uh, census data helps me a little bit sometimes when I'm trying to track people okay. or mm -hmm. see how they're doing economically. And then there are of course, uh, you know, plenty of archives, you know, so I, I worked in you know, I worked in archival papers, sometimes in private hands, but also at the University of Georgia, at Emory University, at the Chattanooga Public Library, okay. at the University of uh, South Carolina, the South Carolina Library, and huh. there. And so they're, they're scattered around in repositories that, you know, universities and private institutions hold, you know, so that research Researchers and thank can come God they're access. there because yeah. where else? Who are you going to call? Who are you going to call? You yeah, can't I mean, call anybody. Ask them. To, today's society, it's a Google search, right? Mm -hmm, and it's funny mm -hmm. because there was something I was searching five years ago 
that was in the early 1990s. Well, today mm -hmm. it's basically been purged from the internet, whether it's a, a data, you know, storage mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. if it's just the algorithms on how to find. It. So I was thinking there, how how do I go back and find that? You know, and that's a yeah. And, um, the internet archive might be a okay a resource to sort of look at what the internet was like at an earlier time. Yes. But, but even from the early 1990s, I don't know if you'll be able to go that far back. Right, that's, that's a good really, question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, you know, now I'm getting old work. enough to where that, you know, want to find something yeah. that was just a couple of years back. So way Spe back now. Speaking yeah. of old, when I was a little girl, we visited the Capitol. And as a child, I think I was in third grade when we went to the Capitol, and, or maybe fifth grade. I can remember looking up at that gold dome mm -hmm. and just thinking, oh my gosh, did you get to go to the Capitol when you were I in did, school? Yeah. I've yeah. been down there. Did you? So, I, mean, I didn't live in Georgia at the okay, time, but I've okay. been to the Capitol and but looked at that gold that dome. is that amazing to look at that? It is. It is absolutely. Now, who, who dreamed that up? Whose, whose plan was that? Oh, I don't know. That was just, I thought it was brilliant. Because no. nobody has a dome like Georgia. No, it's, a, it is it's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it does recall the importance of that North Georgia yes. gold rush yeah. in the history yeah. of the state. Yeah. So how did the gold rush, the removal of the Cherokees, impact the political mm -hmm. changes within our state? You know, what were the political ramifications of all of this? Well, one of the people who emerges from this North Georgia context is going to become the most important politician in 19th century Georgia, and that's mm. Joseph E. Brown. Okay. And that's a name that many people probably recognize. You know, Brown, he's, a, he's born in South Carolina, but he mo his family moves when he's a teenager to right just outside of Dahlonega. Okay. And they grow stuff on their farm, and he just trucks it on into Dahlonega to sell to these gold rushers who have better things to do than farm. Mm -hmm. But he sees that that mint being built. He sees people digging into the hillsides and diverting water courses. And uh, he says, here's, the, here's how you make money, you know. He gets tied in with iron makers and, and he just propels himself. He goes to Cherokee County and becomes a school teacher there. He studies law. He gets taken in by an iron maker who's also a Baptist preacher and says, I want you to go to Yale and top off your education. Mm. So he does. He spends most of a year at Yale, t you know, studying law, but hearing lectures on all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And he comes back and throws himself into politics. He becomes a state legislator and then a judge. And then, he, at 1857, he's a dark horse candidate. And next thing you know, he's the governor of the state of Georgia, mm. 36 years old. Isn't that crazy? So he's on the fast track. And he is, he's <laughs> ambitious, but he's also being surrounded and mentored by other people who they saw talent, they recognized talent, they cultivated talent, mm -hmm. and Joseph E. Brown was their man. Hang on mm -hmm. a second. So they saw talent and cultivated it for the good of the people, not for their own uh, benefit. They, or they, was it they would say it was for the too? good of the people, and it was also for their own benefit. <laughs> They're <laughs> like, we're part of the people, too. I was and like, wait, did we have that, that much integrity back then? Or that, was it? They, 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 they absolutely had election integrity, but, you know, there, I can, I'll tell you more stories on okay. that. But, you know, the thing about Brown is that, you know, I call the book Modern Cronies. Okay. And, and by modern, I just mean that these were people, they were not anti-modern. They didn't have a vision of a kind of feudal past that should extend into the future or a, a cotton kingdom, you know. Brown looks around and he says, yeah, we need agriculture of all mm -hmm. kinds. And we also need towns and cities. We need mm -hmm. industrial growth. You know, we need a diversified economy. Mm -hmm. And so, and he's, he's, uh, he, he, he is, you know, of that kind of mindset. And the other thing is that, you know, Georgia, until he becomes governor, had been really dominated by a coastal political class. Makes sense. Savannah and, yeah. and Augusta were very important, and a lot of these people were plantation types, and they really were very happy to lord over a cotton kingdom. Right. Mm -hmm. And Brown, By you know, he comes in and he says, oh, I see other ways we can make wealth. Mm -hmm. And he comes on down and, and even, you know, you can see it a little bit religiously, just that the, the, that planter class was a lot more Episcopalian, mm -hmm. Presbyterian, kind of high society Georgia. And Brown represents that North Georgia Baptist class. Mm -hmm. and, and for some of those 
some of those fellows, when he goes to the governor's mansion, they're like, oh, Lord, like what has <laughs> happened to the state? You know, Robert Toombs was one of those aristocrat, quasi-aristocratic people. He's like, you know, we've let the bumpkins in now, <laughs> you know. But, but Brown doesn't, doesn't really care. And, of course, who does he bring with him to Milledgeville, where the capital was at the time in right. the 1850s? He brings all the people he's known and trusted. He brings all the talent that has nurtured him and that he's been around to run the penitentiary, to run the state-owned Western and Atlantic Railroad, to be his personal secretary. And, he, and you know, the, some of the newspapers, they complain. They say oh, that yeah. you're turning the railroad into the Cherokee Baptist Railroad. <laughs> And in fact, it. and in fact, there's a story in the newspaper. His Joe Brown's son cuts it out and puts it in his scrapbook. And and you know, is it true? It's probably not true. But but it felt true to a lot right. of people. Yeah. You know, Brown becomes governor of the state. He puts his old Baptist pastor John Lewis in charge of the railroad. And then the story goes that they go up the line and they're sacking all the the station managers and putting their own guys in. And uh, the story was called uh, the, the Right Song in the Nick of Time. <laughs> and they, right they get up to one station and they go inside and the clerk, just the clerk is there. The station manager isn't there. And they, they go up to, and the clerk says, oh, oh, he's out, but he'll be back in just a few minutes. And sure enough, two minutes later, here comes the station manager walking up the steps and he's singing the popular Baptist to hymn tune of the day, <laughs> singing it, and he comes on in and Joe Brown and John W. Lewis look at each other and they just put those dismissal papers back in their pocket and go on to the next station. <laughs> <laughs> and That's so, funny. yeah, and again, you know, we don't know if that, if that happened exactly that way, but it cer certainly felt in right. Georgia like the political class was changing, and it was. I mean, yes. that, that sort of Baptist Sounds dominance. Sounds to me like it's for a betterment because you got working people, you got folks that go to church, you just got the good folks getting in there. So I got to ask this, though. So yeah. when I think of crony, I don't think of a a positive image. So why did you name the book Modern Cronies? Well, because they are cronies. I mean, and I mean it in both the sense that they, Brown knows people and he likes to know people. And, and he, you know, this is a time where you don't, you don't know how to, you, you can't uh, just look into everybody's background and know mm -hmm. whether you can trust them and how can you trust them. Joe Brown knows the people, people he can trust. And you have to know them. And for him, it really is a Baptist network and a temperance network. Right. You know, some people are down at the, the tavern, you know, drinking away their lives. Mm -hmm. And Brown says, I'm throwing in with the Sons of Temperance. Mm -hmm. And these are guys who are getting together to talk about their future and mm -hmm. how it's all going to go. And so, so it's a, so he is, he's very. I think I would have liked Joseph Brown. And I think Joseph. I would have really liked him. Well, there are things to like about him. Yeah, I think yeah. I would have liked him. I mean, I won't. I'll tell you everything I can about Bad him. Bad stuff too. That, well, you know, it's a, it's, 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 a, it's an important life. After all, he was a say. politician. There had to be something bad. You think there's got to be something bad? <laughs> but, be. but but Brown brings in the people, and it does change the political culture of Georgia. It truly does, and uh, and and it's a political culture that you know we can recognize even today as having inherited. And it's mm -hmm. it's not from later on. It really is. It's even before the Civil War that that the wow. that 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 political culture shifts over from a kind of quasi-aristocratic planter class mm -hmm. to a kind of North Georgia Baptist class of I people like who are who felt like that. they can trust each other and they take over the machinery of government and Brown then is he's re-elected three times so he serves four terms they're two-year terms mm -hmm. and he serves from 1857 to 1865 okay. he's Georgia's sole Confederate governor Wow. Okay. And he helps push Georgia into the Confederacy. You know, at the time, North Georgia is the most skeptical region. They're, they've got that Appalachian Unionist. They're not as heavily tied to slavery. And Brown is the person who helps push Georgia out of the Union to become, at first, the Republic of Georgia. Mm -hmm. There is no Confederate States of America to join for a few weeks. And so George, he's just the head of his own little country, the okay. Republic of Georgia. And then early in 1861, you know, it's, it's on into the Confederacy. And, and you know, the, the, the Civil War, you know, winds up being devastating. You know, Joe Brown thought it would be that they would have their own country and he would, Georgia would be this 
linchpin state in this new nation. And by 1865, I mean, you know, the money that he had invested in human slavery, that's evaporated. His house is burned in Canton. His, most of the people he knows and his business ventures. Do you know ventures. exactly where his house was in Canton? Sure, it's where, where right where was. Brown Park is in downtown Canton okay. today. So it's uh, just a little stone throw from mm -hmm. the current Cherokee County Historical right. Society okay. Museum. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, but it stood right there. And, and so things are looking kind of bad for Joe Brown. His I think you're visions his heart. of the future yeah. haven't yeah. really panned out. He writes a letter to his daughter and he says, pretty much, study hard at school because I doubt I'm going to be able to help you much. Yeah. You know, wow. and that hadn't been the case. But Joe Brown is also, he's still, a lot of the people who mentored him have now passed away. But he, in 1865, he's what? He's, uh, he's 44 years old. Okay. And so he is looking around. He becomes the head of the Chief Justice of the Georgia Supreme Court. Okay. And, and as Chief Justice, he's, it doesn't pay what he wants it to pay, but it gives him a little bit of access. And a state legislator comes to him and they say, the railroad that Brown ran for eight years as, as governor. As a Baptist railroad, yeah. <laughs> the, the railroad, they're like, it's all larded up with patronage, and now we're thinking that maybe we ought to lease it out mm -hmm. to a private group mm -hmm. to run. And Brown says, well, I'll help you write that legislation, you know? So he helps write the legislation. Okay. It passes into law, and then what does Brown do? He heads a group that leases the railroad. So he, <laughs> so so there's your cronyism. There you go. Okay, there you go, he man. write. He, That's where it was. He, I could give you more examples, but absolutely, he helps Not write the very legislation. Yeah, yeah. He writes the legislation that he then takes advantage of, and he gets yeah. a 20-year lease of the railroad, and suddenly he's running a major railroad yeah. that runs from Chattanooga to Georgia. Uh, sorry, Chattanooga to Atlanta. Yeah. And Brown also leases the only coal mining there is in Georgia up in northwest Dade County. Okay. And, and who's going to work those mines? The state of Georgia, well, during the Civil War, U.S. soldiers wrecked the penitentiary, mm -hmm. and Brown, as governor, said, I don't, I, we don't have money to build a new penitentiary right now. What are we going to do with prisoners? We should put them to useful work somewhere mm -hmm. and maybe lease them into private hands. Mm -hmm. And so what does he do once he also gets the railroad? He takes advantage of the Ours emerging <laughs> the emerging convict system yeah, yeah. to yeah. get hundreds wow. of convicts that he'll then put to work on, in his Dade County coal mines. And so s pretty soon, by, eight, by the early 1870s, Brown is back. He, <laughs> he, uh, he, he's you know, running that major railroad. He's operating coal mines and mm -hmm. iron furnaces up in northwest Georgia. He's using state-provided convicts as the laborers to work his little integrated economic system. And some people will say, well, this is brand new, but I look back at antebellum Georgia and I say, Brown learned everything he needed to know about late 19th century of Georgia as a young man watching the gold rush and the iron makers and okay. the railroad builders mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at yeah. that earlier time. Mm -hmm. And here, if you want your shenanigans, Brown wanted to be a U.S. Senator. Uh, John B. Gordon was the U.S. Senator and but Gordon didn't have any money, and Brown worked secretly to find a decent paying job with a railroad, and John B. Gordon resigned his Senate seat, and lo and behold, the governor of Georgia appointed Joseph E. Brown. Oh, okay. And so Brown becomes a U.S. Senator and remains so for the next 10 years, most yeah. of the rest of his life. So cronyism, yes, there's cronyism. I yeah, uh, absolutely. But, but yeah. he would say that this was; these were also just people who were taking advantage of what was there. And they also would say, what right. is the important? They would say the role of government is to provide opportunities. Right. And so, and so, and so, Brown thought as governor, provide I'm going to help. I'm going to subsidize the iron makers I know, and we mm -hmm. need a foundry and an armory mm -hmm. in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, so, he, so he, he feels like he is rewarding his friends, but he's rewarding people who are helping the strength of the state of Georgia, the prosperity mm -hmm. of the state of Georgia generally. So I'm not here to defend Brown. I'm just saying when I talk about modern cronies, mm -hmm. 
that is what I mean by cronyism. Mm -hmm. And I suppose how you feel about cronyism depends on whether it has benefited you or whether you've seen your other people benefit from it and you've been left out in the cold. Well, speaking of benefiting, we've got to take a commercial break. When we come back, I want you to think in your mind if a teenager going to school or going to college today had been able to buy gold at $16 an ounce Mm -hmm. and could do something with it today, had held it, and passed it down, what would gold be worth today? I wonder. A lot. We're going to take a commercial break. We'll be right back. Whether you're in the mood for chicken strips, a delicious burger, our classic banana split, or an upside down thick blizzard treat, we've got you covered. Hot and fresh food every day, every time. And delicious DQ soft serve make the perfect pair at your favorite place. Not fast food, fan food fast. Your Blue Ridge, Ella Day, and Jasper Dairy Queens are your meet, eat, and treat headquarters. Thank you for choosing DQ, how may I serve you? The mountains are calling and they're closer than you think. Farmers Crossing and Ball Ground offers creekside lots with homes beginning in the 400s. Walking distance to downtown shopping, dining, tennis courts, Calvin Farmer Park and local events. It also includes a beautiful hike to Long Swamp Creek. Leave the car and the worries behind. Move in by fall 2023. Call Sherry Martin at 404-375-0590 or Evelyn Calhoun at Georgia Medical Treatment Center now has two locations to bring you the high quality holistic care you've come to know and expect. We treat neck, back, and joint pain with chiropractic care and injection-based treatment without the need for surgery or prescription painkillers. Our medical weight loss program can also provide relief while ridding your body of toxins, pounds, and inches while improving your overall health. Call today for a free consultation, 770-345-2000, or go online to georgiamtc.com. Hi, I'm Ryan Blaney, a third generation race car driver. And we dedicate a lot of our time to going as fast as possible. But when my grandpa was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, it was a very unexpected bump in the road for us. It's important to notice if older family members are acting differently, experiencing problems with their memory, or having trouble with routine tasks. Early detection of Alzheimer's can give your family time to explore support services, make a plan for the future, and access available treatments. If you or your family are noticing changes, it could be Alzheimer's. Talk about seeing a doctor together. The ETC Game of the Week is back again this football season. Watch your local teams go head-to-head each week, only on ETC TV3. Whether you're swimming in the sea, or splashing in the pool, making a masterpiece, or just making memories. Writing a great American novel, or writing your term paper that's due tomorrow. Whatever you do in life, Farmers is here to protect it. For all your insurance needs, call Donald Curtis in Blue Ridge. I keep looking at this chart. What is oh, that chart? Well, th- this is just percentage of, you know, I was curious, I was thinking yesterday, because I've, I've been seeing all of the, uh, uh, all of the data on just how much mortgage rates, which were at the 
you know, highest that we've seen in 15, 16 years. I can't remember the number, but, you know, up to 7.5%. Now, this was as of May of, of 2000 and uh, May of 2023, first quarter of this year. So I got to thinking on the way into work this morning. I was like, so what percentage of the population, you know, the median household income, we hear the median, which is the 50th percentile, 50th, the middle of the country, mm -hmm. not the average, but the middle, and, uh, and median home prices. So I got to thinking, well, how many, what percentage of the population can afford homes today? So in May of this year, mortgage rates have moved from 3.82% in 2022 to 6.37 in 2023, which mm -hmm. I think we're around and seven. And actually the 7.5 now. Yeah, we're seven yeah. and a half now, so these numbers yeah. have changed. But this means in order to stay in the typical, you know, the typical mortgage payment has, um, ha as a percentage of income range. So it's what I wanted to look at. I mistyped something there. So the income required to buy the average single family home in the United States rose from 82,000 in Q1 of 2022 to 102,000 in Q1 of 2023, which means you have to have an increase in your income of $19,733 to be able to buy the average mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. And I was telling them earlier, I wish I'd d differentiated whether this was median or average, but the average home price. So what that tells me is that with the Federal Reserve raising interest rates as much as they have, okay, that means 64% of the population cannot afford a home right mm -hmm. now. That's true. And That's only 35 percent because basically just to give you the statistics, the median household income in the United States I think is 70, uh, uh, 68 to 71,000 somewhere in there. Let's say 71,000 because I know it's over 71. So that means 50 percent of the population earns 70, 71,000 dollars a year or less. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I like to look at is supply and demand. So you know, housing's frozen because think about it. I mean, you know, I've got a client who had a child that got a job offer in Texas. Okay, so they they bought a house for a little over three hundred thousand several years back. They've got a three percent mortgage payment. Now, yeah, the house is worth five hundred and fifty thousand supposedly if they can sell it. So they've got some growth, but they still owe three hundred thousand on that mortgage mm -hmm. at three mm -hmm. percent. So they were going to get about a ten thousand dollar pay raise to be able to move to Texas. But the Texas, you know, the housing market in Texas is equivalent to where it is here because prices mm -hmm. haven't dropped. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, because the only thing that's selling on the margin is increasing, so home prices have ticked back up again nationwide. They can't afford to make that move because of a 7.5% mortgage on a $300,000 note. It's a big right? difference. Now your interest, let's just say 7% on $300,000 is $21,000 a year, where when you were at 3%, Okay, that was 9000 So that's a $12,000 increase. So what good does it do them to get a $10,000 pay raise? If they're going to spend nine on When their, they're going to spend yeah. $12,000 yeah. a year more at least Crazy. on that mortgage payment. So, so I just got to thinking, okay, how many people, right? I mean, it's supply and demand. So you've only got, uh, so there are in the United States, 15.9% of our population has a household income between one hundred and 150000 Okay. Eight point three percent of our population has an income between one hundred and fifty thousand and two hundred thousand, and uh, eleven point six percent. You know, you always hear the top ten percent or the top five percent have an income of over two hundred thousand a year. So, you know, you've got a situation which we were talking about a minute ago, where you've got companies like BlackRock and Blackstone, which which have institutional money. So. Your pensions are being managed by a lot of these companies. Mm -hmm. Housing has been strong, you know, and, and they tend to chase returns, right? So now you've got all of this money that's going into these investment companies that are coming in and buying whole subdivisions at a time. Well, what that does is crowd out, um, you know, new home buyers, first time home buyers. Um, you, you know, and they basically corner the rent market. Now, what were you saying? You had a big company come in and... Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, into ball ground, and, and it, it destroyed um, four years' worth of our work because we were going to sell these for 289 to 310 Well, BlackRock came in and zapped them all up, turned them into rental, 
And not only do they have the rental plan, they have a package where if you can't afford to rent or you can't afford your deposit and you can't afford your first and last month's rent, we're gonna loan you that money to do that. That is absurd. Right. That means you're digging a deeper hole, you know, and I don't care whose shovel you're using, you're digging a deeper hole. Yeah. So um, it, it, it traumatized us because that is not at all what we wanted. We chose this development to put for sale homes for 105 families and they came in and scarfed it up just like this under you know just under the radar and and bought it and and made the deal and we couldn't stop it and we were furious no, beyond furious because that was four years worth of work we knew we had so many sales i i had four years to sell 105 houses and we were going to be done and gone and, and move on and do something else a lot of work a lot of effort right. and um, this company sitting in new york said i'm zoning in on ball ground georgia and they did. They certainly did. And it well, was I mean, devastating it, because they're renting these for twenty for nineteen hundred to twenty three hundred per unit to rent. Now if you're yeah. renting a town home for up to twenty three hundred dollars a month, you are never gonna be able to save the money to be a first time buyer. You will never be a first time buyer unless your granny dies and leaves you a whole lot of money or your mama gets run over by the reindeer right. and, and sues Santa Claus. That's the only way you're gonna get any money because there's no way you can pay that kind of rent and pay for groceries and pay for your car and do all you have to do. There's no way in the world. You are, you're setting yourself up for failure. You're making your landlord rent you're making him wealthy and you're killing yourself and your opportunity to buy. Well, and, sad. and not only are you not making your landlord wealthy, don't get me wrong, you're making the landlord wealthy. Yeah. But it's one thing if that money stays within the community. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because it goes to New York City, it, if you, Manhattan. If you've got your <laughs> if you've got your local individual, then then they're spending That's money in the community. That's right. And they're, they're at the Baptist they're, Church they're, on the first row. Yeah. They're That's giving right. to the local football program, yes. they're giving to the yes. local basketball yes. program. Yeah. When you have somebody like a Black Rock come in, they're sucking that money out mm -hmm. of the community. Mm -hmm and that's going to the yachts mm -hmm. and other places and return to shareholders. I mean, it's more than that, it's yeah, not that bad. Yeah. Now, I will say this, y'all know me enough to know that I've claimed that I'm, you know, I'm a political atheist. I believe Christ died on the cross and he is the only answer for my sinful nature, only way to salvation, but I do not worship politicians. As a matter of fact, our problem in this country now is, is is, oh, I'm a Democrat just because I've always been a Democrat, or I'm a Republican just because I've always been a Republican. People aren't paying attention to what both uh, 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 political parties are doing. So They're I've always, failing great on I've both always claimed sides for a long parties, time that, yeah. you know, Democrats are talking out of the left side of their mouth, the Republicans are talking out of the right side of their mouth, but they're all doing the same thing. Now, I despise government regulation and the majority of the regulations that are coming through because the majority of these regulations are protecting corporate interests mm -hmm. and helping helping to bring about monopolies within uh, certain areas. And look, I don't, I don't um, fault businesses for trying to build moats around them, right? I mean, that, that's their nature, but the politicians are supposed to have the integrity to stand up and do right, what's right for the people. Now, you know, of course, we, we hear all of these stories about individuals serving in government, and then they come out and work for these big corporations. In my opinion, that's just a, a, a legal way of bribery. You know, the, I would like to see regulations that come in and go, okay, Mr. Political Leader, once you leave, you know, I, I would be for this. Let's give you a pension. You get in there and you serve. You're making a sacrifice. You're walking away from a business. You know, a, a lot of the people that I know that I would love to see in politics, can't go into it because they've got a business that they've built that is mostly their retirement. If they walk away from that, they're going to sacrifice that business because people are probably not going to be able to run it as good as they are. They mm -hmm. just don't have the passion. So, all right, so if you get elected, you've got a pension for the rest of your life, but you cannot leave and go work for corporate America as a lobbyist or as an employee or anything else, let's say for 12 years. And okay? we see it every day, every and, day. And you know, that may solve a lot of our problems, but at the same time, why can't we bring about legislation that says there has to be some restrictions before big corporations can come in? I mean, we need to have freedom in America, right? I don't know how we deal with this. But maybe you've got a situation, say, okay, BlackRock, if you come in and you make this, this offer for all of these houses here, then, okay, there's a 60-day window 
where a first time home buyer can come in and buy it at that same price. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. you've got government pension money that you're managing, you've got endowment money that you're managing, you've got access to capital that we as citizens don't have access mm -hmm. to capital mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you do it, right? Because I'm not a government regulation fan, but what I can tell you is we got problems. You take student loans, right? You're a professor. So many people have to have student loans. You can't bankrupt student loans. Did you know mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. I do know that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But did you also know that, that student loans are, uh, students are going to pay 7 to 9 percent on something that is the safest loan that you can have as a lender out there because you can garnish wages, you can garnish Social Security income. So I've had individuals that have come in and talked to me that co-signed the notes for their children who came out, couldn't get jobs, they borrowed way too much money, and they've gotten depressed, gotten into drugs or something like that, and they just check out of society, right? Well, That's guess sad. what? They're, gar they're, they're garnering, they're garnishing, yeah. they're garnishing um, uh, Social Security wages to pay for that. You can't bankrupt out of it, mm -hmm. but yet, you're paying twice what you could do if you're a, if you're, you know, why in the world are we allowing that type of interest to be charged to our students when we go forward? Basically, all right, if you want a loan, it's a, you can't bankrupt out of it, you should be paying half what the Federal Reserve is charging out there. So if it's five and a quarter is what the Federal Reserve sets the rates at that the government's borrowing from, okay, well, if we're going to help our students, again, I'm not for you know, just give everybody everything, but we've got to reverse this the other way where corporations aren't making all this money on our, on the, on our future. And the problem is, is a lot of conversations that I'm having is the baby boomer generation doesn't understand the economy that you have given your kids and grandkids, mm -hmm. okay? Because the thing is, we'll just work harder and sacrifice. Well, in a lot of cases, kids are working as hard as they can, but you can't make enough sacrifices when a big company comes in and buys up all the houses mm -hmm. in your neighborhood. You can't make enough sacrifices when the government under your watch has printed so much money that it's inflated the value of homes to the point that there's just too much money chasing too few homes out there mm -hmm. and the kids can't afford them. So you're building a renter nation. So, so we're at a point right now, economically, and I don't know when it is, right? Because these things can carry on a lot longer than most people can can be patient or, or see into the future. But we're at a point where something is going to break. And if we don't deal with it sooner rather than later, if we keep sticking our heads in the sand and we keep trying to kick this can down the road, then you're gonna continue to see, see society fall apart to the point that something really bad is coming. Just don't know when it is. I don't know. But, but I will coming. tell you this, uh, you individuals out there, You've got to reach out and share your opinions with your senators and your congressmen. Write them, call them, hound them. You, you can't just watch the television and assume that because you're hearing about it that somebody's talking about it. Because if you're not talking to them and you're sharing your opinion, now I'm not saying, and you've got to be wise about this, right? If somebody comes up in your face, oh, you're a piece of junk and blah, 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 you're a turd and blah, blah, are you going to listen to them? No. So you write a calm and wise letter and you, and it's easy to do. You can go on to, like I wrote a, a, a letter to Senator Warnock yesterday expressing my frustration with some of the things that are taking place in the political process, and, and I did it. You know, I had to write, read it, write it, read it, rewrite it, read it, <laughs> till I finally got down to the point that, look, this isn't a Democrat thing. This isn't a Republican thing. This is for what's, you know, the good of the American people. And if they're not hearing from you, who are they hearing from? the money centers, and the lobbyists. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. so, anyway, that's my rant for And today. we have a very short time, but I have to tell you, in order to pick up Dr. Ken Wheeler's book, you do, how do, you, how do people buy it? Well, you can buy the book directly from the University of Georgia Press. Okay. You can buy it at other online retailers, okay. uh, like Amazon.com. Modern cronies. Yeah. Yeah. There are e easy ways to get a hold of and it. And you got to come back because there's a whole other show in this. Thank right. you. We got to do it. We got to plan it. We all together again. Got yeah. a question. Are you going to write any more books to follow up after that window of time? Uh, we'll just have to see. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll just have to see. But I do have a lot of historical interests and projects underway. And so yeah. I'll, okay. I'll just have to take a little time before I see how those man, uh, unfold. There you go. Thank, Thank you, you so Remember, much. Kiker Wealth Management, pick up the phone. 
get him to manage your money and get him to tell you how do you go to the grocery store and not come out <laughs> crying. <laughs> That's impossible today. I'll see y'all again soon only on ETC. Bye, y'all. Thank you.